still have a cover. Mm -hmm. You guys buy it here. Okay. Yeah, down in, yeah. So that's not going up the road. Okay. Unless you don't want to ever. Yeah. So for the most part, that's the most part. The other thing you can see it. Okay. And like I said, so the last week, I pulled up the original one, which was the new one when I got here. Uh, they're open six days a week, eight to four. Our landfill, my landfill, was open six to four every day because of. Uh, Help out, help waste management because they they run their trucks all day long, and then they'd be parked in front of the gate at 0600 to empty and go home. <laughs> but I'm, what I'm thinking, tell me not to mention. But let's say next year, always that. I'm, I'm assuming all four counties can be made. Is that correct? I don't know. Well, I'm both. You don't have to worry about it. What in the world? Two counties, three counties. Two counties. Use that much. <laughs> 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 you don't have to crap off the road and pay for it. That's not fair. I don't know. 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 Well, the only thing is, is that revenue is. Well, we're still going to work. I don't know if it would. We need to start our meeting. We extend the prayer and pray to Father in heaven. We thank you right now for this hour. We thank you for this opportunity. We bless your name because your name worthy to be blessed. And Father, we thank you for what you've done for us, where you're carrying us to and where you're leading us from. We thank you right now. Father, as we come, we come praying for the world peace. And, and, and we just bless those people in Ukraine and Russia, Father, that they can get it together and, and live peacefully. Thank you now for what you've done. Father, we pray for the sick and the shut in, those that's prison brown, those that's free, those that walk the streets all night long. We pray for them too. Father, then we pray for this council uh, commission. We pray for the administration. We pray for everybody that's involved. That we'll be able to work and come to some cool solution. Help us now, Father. It's only you can do and you will do. And we thank you for what you're going to do now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation. Under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. As always, before we start our meeting, we have one or two housekeepers. And the conference line has been set up. The number is 1 917 900 1022. Access code is 323470 pounds. This is not a toll free number. You may be subject to a long distance charge because of your long distance plan. When the chairperson opened the meeting for public comment, please follow the below instruction. If you wish to speak, please dial 5. The moderator will unmute your line when it's your turn to speak and notify you by the, announcing the last four digits of your telephone number. Please announce your name and address and you will be allowed to speak for three minutes. Any person wishing to address the board regarding an agenda item will be given three minutes. Three minutes for comments, and a commenter may only speak once or one time for each agenda item. With that being said, the board to discuss solid waste operation. Commissioner Brady will be here in just a few minutes. Yeah. Let me check on Commissioner Cable.
Don't we answer. No answer, but I texted. Okay. The board to discuss solid waste operation. You want to go first? <laughs> <laughs> um, I can follow up on some information that was requested at the last. Um, workshop, okay. if it pleases the board. Uh, so there was a discussion about um, the potential cost savings if every roll-off site was closed one day a week. Okay. And so I ran some numbers, and I used, I tried to use average, average numbers just so you know it didn't become too difficult. But it looks like the approximate annual savings. If we closed every site one day per week, would be sixty thousand six hundred and ninety-three dollars, and that is a very rough number. Sixty thousand. Um, sixty thousand what? Six ninety-three. Sixty thousand six ninety-three. Because, as you know, if we reduce the hours that the sites are operational, all you're saving is your hourly labor. Your overhead remains the same. The only, the only true variable cost is your hourly labor for the roll off site attendance. Your administration costs are the same, your all your other operational costs stay the same, and you would not reduce the tonnage. You would just reduce the number of days the sites were open. Just one question. If you say by closing those sites, you're talking about those that are open seven days a week? Yes, sir. That number, if we only closed the sites that were open seven days a week, was closer to $40,000 a year. But what I was, I, <coughs> I believe what I was requested to bring back to the board were the potential savings if every <coughs> site closed one day a week. And that would leave some sites that were would only be open two days a week. Some sites now. Well, if you closed every site one day per week, Gary, what sites are open just three days? Um, got, uh, Salem? Salem, Deerdew, mm -hmm. and 1498 is open four days. Yes. So those two, those sites would only be open <coughs> if you took that approach. 1498 is open four days? Mm -hmm. Salem, Deerdew. That's three sites, right? Cool. And everything else is open seven days? Yes. They want to do this is the third. Sorry. Uh, 1498. 1498. Okay. Yeah. And you say the difference between only closing those that are open seven days a week is what amount? So if we. Um, it would be a difference of about $20,000 a year. <coughs> a rough estimate. And that's because of not paying that labor? Correct. So if you consider, so this is an average cost per hour for a site attendant at $11 per hour with the fringe, it translates to $13.46 an hour. Are your savings? Eighteen forty-six per hour. For your your <clears throat> hourly rate and your fringe, because um, and that's that's for part-time attendants who do not um, have health insurance benefits. Mm -hmm. 
No, I just used the part time because I didn't want to yeah, over inflate the number. So as I said, that's that's a pretty rough draft. So let me ask if I understand that for those sites that are operating seven days a week, that's with different personnel. Yes. Or are those full time positions? So um it depends. You got three full time. Right. Well, two and then fourteen ninety eight. She's full. Yes. Yes. You got sale. I mean, steam hatchy and Carlton. Are full time. And both and just one attendant at Carlton is full time. Okay. Well, how many sites did we have all together? Eight. Nine. Nine, Nine sites. Um, any questions about that? So obviously, if, if you wanted to for F, so if you wanted to close sites twice, two days a week, you would just double that number to get a rough estimate of the cost savings. <clears throat> well, if, if you do that, you're saying you're only going to operate these three sites one day a week. I'm just saying. I'm not suggesting we do no, that. No, I'm just trying to understand the logic. I don't. I was I was asked to bring back the dollar value for closing sites one day, two days, whatever. So one day, <clears throat> every site is sixty thousand six ninety three. So that would mean two days for every site would be double that. And of course, obviously, there's some numbers in between. So if you only close the sites that are open seven days a week, it would be somewhere around $40,000. If you close every <clears> site <throat> one day a week, it's $60,000. And then for every day that you add on, you can, you know, it's somewhere between the 60,000 and 120,000. Um, the sure. other question that was asked by a citizen um, and um, he's asked it twice, is the approximate cost per mile for our trucks. Um, and that is estimated for the, um, the vehicle cost and the drivers only um, to be somewhere around $2.43 a mile. And that's, again, a very rough number. You include fuel? Yes, sir. So what I did, this is how I came at that number, and that's why I say it's so rough. We don't we don't use the cost accounting method here. So what I did was I asked for a report that showed September fuel, only diesel was 2,061 gallons. Our average mile per gallon for the, the roll-off trucks is five and a half miles per gallon. So that's how I came up with the projected number of miles per year, which is what I use um, to come to the approximate cost per mile. So we calculated the driver's salaries and wages, diesel fuel, lease payment for one truck, insurance, just the auto, um, the general auto and the auto liability, the repair and maintenance of auto, and the total was $337,000 and some change. And, um, and, and so the approximate annual miles is 138,996 for three trucks because the other truck and driver are charged to recycle. So that's how I came to that number. And then the other request, I believe, was um, to do some um, investigating into uh, curbside pickup. And I don't have, I, I'm hesitant to quote numbers from other counties that may not be, um, that may not be accurate for, as far as what we could expect to pay. But I can tell you that Swanee County, um, back in April, I believe, um, advertised a, an RFP. And um, 
I will say that if that's something that we wish to do, it would certainly be pretty simple to customize. Um, and we could ask for proposals for one time a week pickup, twice a week. We could um, ask for quotes for operating, operating a site to take bulky items, C and D, lambs over a certain size. And we could certainly ask for different options. And I, but I don't know if our present assessment would cover that. Because if you think about it, Taylor County geologically, geographically is a big county. But I think I, I'm afraid that something would drive that cost would be density. So if you have, you know, approximately 9,500 households who pay the assessment and it's spread over a big county, I don't know what that would do to the cost in today's market with fuel and, you know, minimum wage and all that. I don't know that it <clears> could be operated. I'm not saying they wouldn't be more efficient, but I don't know if our if our new assessment would cover that, um, if you're talking about curbside service. Now, Gary's going to try to help me remember, and I look back in the minutes, I do know that um, Mr. Lakey brought a number to the board some, some number of years ago. Commissioner Moody, do you remember what that number was for, for curbside pickup? I want to, we were thinking it was somewhere over $200 a household. Um, that was for households already gone, wasn't it? So. Well, but I don't know if they would if they would agree to operate a site for bulky items. I mean, that's I, I couldn't find anything on it in the minutes. I don't remember them talking about one site. Okay. Well, I don't think we had a lot of information at that time, so I don't know what was discussed with that particular. Um, that particular contractor. I just remember they said it. I, mean, I don't remember it was household garbage only. Right. But I remember. But you don't remember the number? No, okay. But it was bag, bag, household garbage. Right. I remember. It seems like it was over, over $200 a household. I don't think it was. I was thinking in the 230 range. And I didn't, I wasn't sure how many days a week there were. I was out of that. I, I wasn't involved in it. But if it was only one or two days, I wasn't sure. But they're, and they brought up the prior one we were, I was involved in was the same thing. The density of the county is what really. I would go. think that would be a consideration, especially in today's. And that would gas mm -hmm. twice as much. It would probably be. How long ago was that proposal? Oh, years ago. So back in 2017, maybe? Only five years ago, yeah. Price of price and then picking it up then was a lot cheaper than it would be now, you know, that many years ago. But I, um, so I can, I mean, I've reviewed Swanee County's um, request for proposal package and it seems fairly straightforward. If, if y'all want to do that, we can certainly, we can certainly advertise at some point, but I don't, I don't know if that's something you're ready to do right now or if you want to wait until um, I can get more information from other counties and what their cost is and and maybe reach out to a county who's more consistent. I don't know that Swanee County is a good comparison because I would say that um, density is a big factor there. Are there any counties that are similar to our county that does curbside pickup? Who's that, Jenny? Are there any counties that are similar to our county that does curbside pickup? What's killing you is I think ours is one of the largest counties. If you go from like Erie to the Steen Hatchie, that's that's where the and the households. I think Swanee's probably around sixteen thousand five hundred, and we're probably eleven. No, it's more like ninety-seven hundred. Yeah, not, so we're way below them. And we're spread out, except we're spread for some out, probably a third more, I would think. Yeah. So that would really cripple you trying to. You know, Steve Hatch would be easy fix, but when you pull out of there and go, you know, towards the Osceola and all that, you know, you can bring for miles in that household. That's where the problem gets. Um, the other, any questions about that? 
Well, I have a question. So doesn't Dixie County do something similar to that as far as pickup? I'm oh, not no. sure on that. I talked to them last week and uh, I, they never, when I was down there, they had nothing like that. They operate roll-off sites and they have a transfer station. That's all. They're doing compactors too because they called me about that. They want to come down and look at our compactors, how we're set up. I got a similar yeah, request. So, so <laughs> probably for discussion purposes, I mean, we, yeah. our, our rate is set. So I think you know, if we couldn't, obviously we couldn't go to a curbside pickup. Well, what I would say is if you'll allow me to try to do a little more research and see if I can find a comparable county who's recently advertised. Now, I do think there are maybe two other um, cities or counties who are considering advertising um, their, an RFP for curbside service, um, maybe get a little more information about how things shake out with Swanee County. I think I can bring back some better information. I just didn't want to bring information that I did not feel like was relevant because, you know, the numbers can be totally different um, in today's market. Well, I'm looking at the curbside pickup, but I think, you know, actually thinking that if we're at a $230 assessment, we're already above, I mean, I, I think we're just, Assuming that's probably about what the number was. If we go and do a, a, another RFP and it comes back to that, could be 280 bucks. I mean, whatever, $300 on the assessment. I mean, what does that what does that do with the study that we just, we just done? I mean, how? Does it do? <laughs> right. Well, I I do believe that we could. I don't think the study is necessarily irrelevant, but what we have to remember is what we advertise. So we advertise a maximum annual rate of $210. So no matter which way we go, we can't go above that without going through the notification process again and notifying, you know, 10 or 11,000 people. That's whether, we, that's whether we go back, go to curbside. If if you if you went any way that you would increase that assessment above that advertised, yeah. Yeah. then we would have to re, we would have to re-notice. Yeah. We're sitting at the table today because of no one's happy with the current rate. A lot of folks are not happy with the current rate, so we're trying to figure out keep that rate either where it's at or for surely not increase it if not you know bring it down at some point. Well what I would what I would say is something that you we probably need to keep in mind is that the purpose of doing a rate study every five years is to give us, you know, to try to um, get into the habit of every year we look at that, we look at our expenditures and we are current expenditures and we look at our proposed expenditures and we look at our revenue and if we could come down then we can we can do that my only concern is that we don't have any reserves in in this department and I mean I would love it if next year the price of fuel is much less than it is now and we were able to go down on the assessment, but we do need to we do need to consider that we may we really need to build those reserves up if we can to, to some level because they're well. I don't know what they'll be at the end of the fiscal year of this year. Mm -hmm. um, not taking into account contingency and cash balance, it'll only be eighty thousand dollars. And how much do you really need to kick? Is there a certain amount you need to carry? The auditor recommends 30% of, of your expenditures. Which is going to be about 30% of 1.4 million. 1.4 million. Yeah, 1.4 when you take capital out. 1.4. <clears throat> That's a, okay. I'm a, uh, 
Um, just to tag on to what Lawanda said uh, about putting out an RFP for uh, curbside. Remember, I brought your number last meeting. I'm sorry I didn't bring my notes. Uh, think of what you pay. I don't know who lives in the city, Mr. Dems. You might. What the city people pay for a year for curbside plus once a month pickup of limbs and C and D in a nine, nine square miles area. And it is close to, I think it was close to $300 a year. It just to tag along with what Ms. Lawanda was saying. Keep that in the back of your mind. As Gary mentioned, we're spread out. And if I may suggest, um, about 15 years ago, when this came up, I think it was even before your time, uh, <coughs> I went up to Brooks County, Georgia, and spoke with them and took a ride around the county. And they have curbside. But I mean, we drive for miles, and all of a sudden there'd be a house. But I can't give you numbers from that long ago. But they've had curbside, and I don't know how big Brooks. Just, just I mean, I, it's a consideration, and it wouldn't hurt to to advertise and to get the numbers. But I just don't know if if y'all are at the point. Um, so you pick it up once or twice a week. They pick it up twice. Twice. And then they pick up large items. Large items once a month. Once a month. The city picks up twice a week. Twice a week, yeah. Monday, Thursday, Tuesday, Friday, and then I think on Wednesdays once a month. And they got the city broken up into four districts, I believe. So if you don't get it out, you're stuck. <laughs> now, speaking of large items, we did, or Gary and Hank, did run a test on trying to crush um, loads in a container um, at Carlton Cemetery. And do you want to talk about this, Gary, or do you want me to? Okay. So, so if you recall, uh, if you recall at our last workshop, I gave y'all pictures of one of the containers with the bulky items in it. And so the average weight of those containers was probably a little over three tons because one was 3.85 and the other was 2.61. And so um, they um, had to crush the items in the container five times to get close to six tons, which is about double, um, about double what you can can get in a container. Um, we, we did bend one container, right? And it was a little bit of a challenge to get the materials out, but we did it. So Gary and I, I did some very rough math. And if you look at you know, the average loads a year from Carlton Cemetery, the way we figured it is there are somewhere around 709 loads a year. Approximately half of those loads are not compacted. And we, we're not worried about metal or, you know, any, any of the white goods because they don't go to the landfill. So that leaves half of the loads statistically that are not compacted. So, um, so that's 355 loads. And then if I divide that by two, because we were able to double the amount, the weight in a container, then that's 177.5 fewer loads in a year. Now, if you multiply that by a round trip to Osceola, which is somewhere around 60.42 miles, and you multiply that by our cost per mile, it comes out somewhere around $10,724.55 in savings a year. 10000 10, And that's only at one site. So I guess the question is, you know, I think the correct piece of equipment that we would want to use to do something like that would be more like a knuckle boom. <laughs> because you can control, you know, where that compaction is coming from. And I don't, I'm going to guess the cost of a knuckle boom. Hank said he thought it was around $100,000. Between 100, I think, and 130. Right. And then you have your operator cost and your fuel. Now, I'm not, I, I guess the question is, or really, I guess this lets us know why we haven't been Compact, trying to crush those loads in the past 
because I, I mean, I'm not saying $10,000 isn't something that we should try to save, but I don't know how feasible it is. It would take us 10 years just to, if we just did it at one site, to recover the cost of the equipment. And just one piece of equipment. One piece of equipment. And you've got to hire employees to run it. So that's about, you know, $40,000 a year. Now, we wouldn't need a dedicated employee if we just did it at one site. But I'm, I'm not entirely sure that it would be cost effective to try to compact every, every load at every site. We would, I, I'm not even sure how we would do it unless we, unless we had one location that those containers were brought to and left there. And then somebody, but then they would have to go back and forth and back and forth to the sites. Or, or if we had the equipment you know, we could take it to each site and, you know, but then again, I, I, I don't know, we may, I don't know if we could break even or not. I don't know. Carlton is one of our busier sites that, you know, where we would have that type of tonnage or that many loads. So we would have to look at it a little bit closer to see if that would be cost effective. But we were able to, you know, pretty much double the weight in that one container. It just took a while. Okay. But then you've probably got three sites like that, Steen, Hampton, Carlton, and one over here. Uh, Harrison Blue. Yeah, Harrison Blue. Right. Three. That are, those are our busiest sites, right? Steen, Hatchie, Carlton Cemetery, and, and Harrison Blue. So it's possible that if we, you know, if we, bought a knuckle boom, or even if we tried to use, I mean, I, I don't want to take one of our public works um, machines out of service, but um, I mean, we could, I mean, we could go from site to site and try to compact it. It's just hard to, it's just is hard to try to. Like that. Is that on a truck or is that on a, 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 another moving piece of equipment? It's on a truck. You can get one with a truck. Oh, so you don't have to transport it? You could drive it or you could get an a excavator with traps, a small one, and you can load it on a trailer. A trailer. Truck. Okay. A small excavator would give you a little more use for two different things if you had a small excavator, you know, and a trailer and truck pull it around. But that would be about the same, that would be about the same investment, wouldn't it? It would be. Yeah. It would be. Because a small estimator would do a better job actually than knuckle boom would. It probably would, and with the rubber tracks, with that asphalt up there, when you drop in, like when we went in there with the backhoe, when you drop the stabilizer down and jacked that backhoe up, it started damaging the asphalt a little bit, so we had to back off a little bit. And like I say, we crushed it five times, so to get that amount, it was a lot of, not a lot of time, but it was time consuming. Because you had to put more trash and then come back and do it again. It, it wasn't just, you know, right there, dump it in there and, and keep compacting it. That was over a course of three days, I think, that we did that. We looked at it when y'all were doing it a couple times, you know, and, and it, it really, it was doing a good job, nice and all that old loose stuff down. It was crushing a lot of stuff and, and pushing it down where, you know, like I said, it doubled the weight. Yeah, and that was I, I honestly thought we would get more weight. I really did. Like some were, we crushed them three times, only got four, 4.9, and stuff like that, you know. But I thought, honestly, that when we crushed them five times, we would be around six, five, somewhere around there. And I was shocked when he ran that first load. I didn't, I was questioning that. I didn't think it was right. but. And a compacted load is really closer to nine or ten tons, right? You know, it goes to the compact. Yeah, and the comp, yeah. And it's designed different that octagon it, it rolls the garbage up. We were compressing down, it's a little different. So just you know, more information to yeah. to consider. Um That sounds like you're going to you would spend 10 times the amount you would save. Basically, that at one side. <coughs> I'm just saying rough numbers, not 
Well, if you did that at one site and it was a busy site, that would be 177 fewer loads. Well, uh, maybe we got to come back. We got to bring the sites, do away with the sites, and put make the site bigger at, at one point to really yeah. save money because it's saving labor. And all by doing that, you know, somebody have to drive a little farther to get to a site. But my thing, I hope I ain't always going to do it, is, is bring it to just a few sites. Okay, that's my feeling on it. You know, just scattered all over the county with these sites. It's, 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 it's a lot of fuel and a lot of labor and a lot of. Some sites don't even want to have nobody going to them. But they're just <clears throat> man, you know, and we gotta get garbage. But I mean, for us to take things out there on the day, I have never been to that site when I when I stay down that way a lot. Never been to that site when I had a wait line <laughs> to get to the compact. I mean, never seen nobody yet when I pulled up there. You know, I'm not trying to cost nobody their job. What I'm saying is, we got. My feeling is we're gonna have to bring this thing together. <clears throat> just a few sites and, 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 and really concentrate on doing the best thing we can with those few sites. Well, and along, I mean, along those lines with our chronic um, challenges with keeping those, the, every site manned, um, one of the reasons that our budget is higher next year is to account for overtime because we we cannot, it, it's very difficult to man the sites. I, if the sites were, say, closed on Sunday, Sunday is the, your biggest challenge, Monday, right? Yeah, because right. they like to go to church on Sunday, you know, and uh, I can see that. I mean, uh, and if you check around the other counties, normally they take Sundays off. They shut them down. We, we did something on that, but I know we impact six sites that are seven days a week. I mean, would that be a reasonable you know, expectation of beginning for this board to say, cause of staffing issues, the costs that are associated with that, we could have a trial basis to, to see how that may work in respect to logistics of transport when we come down. You know, from my understanding, what well, my expectation is, the tonnage. Is going to be equal when we say if we work, <coughs> we're going to operate six days instead of seven days. Now, what that changes, I think, correct me please if that's a mistake, but I think the difference might be some of your overtime hours versus not, or the struggles to get folks to staff in position. <coughs> so for me, I would be more willing to say, in the sake of being able to staff the sites. And then look at what the cost savings are going to be. So let's consider a, a trial basis of that time that we could say we're going to look at operating six days a week. Cause of the struggles of staff, the cause of the affiliated costs that come with it. I mean, I think it's a it's a win-win in the sense that you're you're dealing with your issues of outages of, of tenants, and then. You know, there's another benefit when we're not having to pay overtime versus paying straight time. So as of the end of last fiscal year, we expended $24,000 in overtime. It's always. It's always. Julian, you talking about consolidating sites and maybe, you know, I'm just going to use you to do sites. It's not that far from Shady Grove site. How many sites do you see that potentially could be consolidated? Well, I know, you know the low traffic areas and, you know, the, I, I really think 1498 for them people down there need to stay open. I, I'd agree. Yeah, I, I think that Salem, you could look at it, but we could do a count how many people come in there. It's real low volume. The compactor there at Salem we pulled it today and we won't pull it again till January. Mm -hmm. So, well, uh, that's not, that's not uh, accurate because some of the times that garbage is put it is, on here. It is. 
what I was stating. So, so that's a misconception. They may only have 15 people a day come into the site. Well, certainly be low volume, but I think stretch on time frame doesn't account for the times I've been told myself. Put it up there on the hill and it's not the fact. So I be careful about jumping to a conclusion because it appears that it's going to be 60 days before you move that. I don't, I don't well, think that's a fair well, rule. Well, let's look at the numbers. Hold, let's let's look at the numbers. Cans we pulled. Yeah. Well, I understand it, but let's also look at that distance from where if you consolidate that, those folks are going to go to. Well, that's the first one. I'm, I'm, I'm stating the fact the low volume areas is the first place you're going to look. And air dues is a prime example. Okay, so let, let's look at the numbers. Hold on. So if you look at Salem, and this was, this was the tonnage from 3 July. I have, we, I'm still working off those numbers. So that was 75% um, of the year. There were 80 tons at Salem, Salem and 21 loads. Very similar to Eridu. Eridu was 69.78 tons, 21 loads. And then the other site is 98.14, 59 tons, 18 loads. So there are three there are three sites that are low volume, but then I think the second part that you do have to look at is geographically, you know, folks in that area. If if I mean, is there another option? Ninety eight fourteen is kind of in a, a an isolated area. How so? Ninety eight fourteen. What is the closest site to ninety eight fourteen? You'd have to come into town and get Carlton Cemetery. Yeah. Probably okay. So Salem, what is the closest site? I'm not sure the mileage differential on that, but it, it's a little bit of a haul probably from Salem. Yeah, it's pretty I'd say it compared to 9814. Yeah, so, right. so, and, so that's where I'm really getting over it. I'm just looking at different ways. We've sat here and kind of brainstormed, we're talking about different ways to save some money. And I, I know you talked about closing one day per week, and I just wanted to look at you know, what could we consolidate? So, so kind of what I'm hearing really, the only, for me looking at it, the only thing that would only site that we might could consolidate would be the Eridu side and push those folks to the Shady Grove side. How many miles is it, Gary? I would guess five miles. I would guess so, five. So, so if you look so, at the, the mileage, maybe so, that would be the least impacted. And, that, and that's not a big, might not be a big number, but we could consolidate. You probably could use the people elsewhere. You know, the, you may could use the, the folks elsewhere, elsewhere. You know, but uh, and also, so we've done away with here, do so that leads us to eight sites. We got fourteen and ninety-eight open four days. I'd be okay to go to one day a week on that. When our Johnson um, could go, I'd be with Salem. I might with. You're looking at the numbers, maybe one day a week there. And on the other six sites, cut two days, cut them down to five days a week versus seven days. Is there any reason to have to, be, have to have drop off for seven days? I mean, I think it comes down to volume, and, and I think in some of the sites, are really, when you start saying, okay, we're going to do one day a week, you can't spread that same personnel across those same sites because you know, somebody's going to say, okay, if I'm, I'm one day a week, then I'm on Saturday. It's probably going to be more difficult to staff. If I had guess, you know, and if you say, well, we're going to be open all day a week, all day on Tuesday, you're not going to get the benefit of all day because folks aren't you know, available when they're at work. So I think, I think in that, if you start saying, well, okay, we could just say eight hours. If we want to say a day is eight hours. The problem with that is you got twice the transit, and then you run across folks <laughs> doing that distance and all of this. So, so just to say one day a week, I mean, it sounds good, it looks good on paper, but I'm just not sure that it's going to have the same that results when we really get to that place. Because if we say, okay, we're going, we're going to minimize dates. First thing each side's going to say is, is I won't say because of availability and convenience. It's my yes. So would you say that you would need to be open on a Saturday in order to? If you, I think if you look at the busiest days, yeah. that's how you would yeah. gauge that. 
you know, we could do accounting. I'm not even opposed to you know, Salem and, you know. When, when you look at, let's say, Salem, if you went down, instead of eight hours, maybe look at, because people work at the mill and have odd shifts, maybe, you know, seven to seven or something, you know, uh, extra hours. I mean, if you look at the hours that you're currently at there, you're really not far from that. So if you say, hey, we're going to trim a day a week from these seven day sites, that's not impact Salem because they're not open on Sunday anyway. They're not a seven day side, it's a three day side. So um, I think I think some of that may again give a give an indication that you you might be saving something, but I'd be careful about really at the end of it what you're going to net because again if you if you go at hours and you say, all right, well, we're we're open um, twenty hours, we're going to cut a half. Seven to seven, twelve hours. I mean, but we were going to make that nine to seven, whatever, for ten hour. You know, you, you still in the in the instance that you're looking at that hour frame, it's one one commute because you're there the full time that you're going to be open. I think the the disadvantage to that is if we're saying we're not going to be open on Sundays or on, which is obviously the weekend. I don't think you get the same. Availability of, of the site being open and folks being in a place that they can use the site. So on the six that are seven days, if you open them five days a week and bring in the same trash and get the same job done, Tuesday through Saturday, you the Tuesday through Saturday. We could, we could try it. I mean, there'll be. If you looked at Carlton, for example, they have a large volume there. I mean, it's steady. We would just, there'd be a lot more volume coming in in five days because it'd be compressed. But I'd say we couldn't do it. I'm not yeah, sure. but think about that intersection there. Remember during COVID when we cut we down the hours? Highway, yeah. It was, it was, it, we had some traffic hazards. And I can't recall how many days. We, when we started opening back up, how many days that was? <laughs> it was, and people were, I mean, that that intersection got jammed up pretty quick. That will do to what? That will do to what? It was back to the ball with an intersection on the bucket road there, trying to turn into the dump. So during COVID? That was during, there was a short period of time that, that we were, there was three weeks, I think, where we put the containers on the outside of the gates because we did not have PPE, you know, that was at the very beginning of COVID and there was a supply chain issue. So we basically just shut down operations, put the containers on the outside of the gates and for several weeks, but then when we opened back up, we, um, I think it, I can't remember how many days a week it was that we opened back up. But it was it was it was a little painful at that particular site because it's so it was busy. Like trying to buy toilet paper at Walmart <laughs> at the same time. That's a, and that's the only one I can think of where, besides Steen Hatchie, maybe where Steen Hatchie was a little bit, but I don't think at that point. You're talking the site was completely pretty much shut down for three weeks. I mean. You're talking still having the site open for five days a week. Yes, sir. I, I understand what you're saying. I I that I just wanted to bring up that sometimes that we had experienced um so a little bit of a traffic issue at that particular site, um, because there was nowhere for cars to stage, you know, while while they were waiting for the site to open. And I know that if Steam Hatchy, if we ever have an issue where a site doesn't open on time the cars will be lined up all the way back to the highway um, just because there's not, I mean, they're just very, very busy sites and there's not a lot of room for people to wait. Well, that's still actually on the spring was down the security at the highway. Well, that's correct too. That's a little bit more of a complicated as far as. Yeah, yeah, Blue Springs isn't quite as busy, but you're right. That yeah, you've got enough room for one hog truck. That's how we gauged it, a truck company. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Right, so maybe two vehicles about trailers or so. But once people got used to it, I mean, I'm sure we could overcome that. You know, I, I, just for I don't know Madison County. I know I don't want to use the word catalog again. But anything you bring in, you can kick it off. 
you, you accept it. <clears throat> Madison County, anything you can pick up and put in the garbage, they accept it. Right. Yeah, I think that's the difference in the, now. Even Madison County moved their site from where they used to be. We need to look at some real estate and see where can we use better utilize putting up a, a site rather than we don't have to stay in Carlton. I don't recognize it. They're better site than Carlton. Uh, now, are you you're speaking of if moving we had the site, yes moving the site somewhere else? You know because it's there now it doesn't have to remain there. We've got uh, we've got a piece of property right there. The airport could be used for a bigger site. Mm -hmm. Not behind the airport, but you know, that's the county owns. What about ten acres in that area right there on the on the where it used to be the uh, that fenced off area where the independent kind of gun authority was? No, it's uh, it used to belong, the county got it back. It's right there on the back side of the airport. It's about 10 acres between uh, Mr. Mr. Swain's farm yeah. and, and the cemetery. Right That's there. the cemetery, yeah. Yeah, it's about 10 acres there. It's between the cemetery and Mr. Swain's hand there. That's on the same, same side of the road as the airport. But uh, Georgia Pacific talked to them about giving more property to Carlton, and they, they were fine with that if we work from, you know, we work with them. They, they said they'd give us more, more property there. Well, well, you're probably just referring to that intersection, being close to that intersection. Yeah. Okay. I was down there the other day and it looked like they had a couple of hogs or something over there just across the street. Man. I might have thrown a big boy hog out over across the street. <laughs> 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 well, that's the one they're calling. Yeah, I wonder if that opened the hogs when that happened. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they just looked across the street. Oh. That corner gets a lot of, during hunt season, gets a lot of buckets of guts and periods over there because they can pull off the road and they got a little cover there, they just pour them out. Yeah. Well, and and still the unresolved, I think one of the reasons we started discussing solid waste is that at, at some point we do need to try to come to some type of solution for um, taking, taking limbs. Now, let me clarify with the limbs to make sure we're all on the same page. We can take limbs that are four inches in diameter and four feet long. That is considered yard debris. So if people bring in the small limbs, we can take those as long as it's residential and it's not a contractor. What we're struggling with is the limbs that are much bigger. The old ordinance had a size limit of 12 inches in diameter by four feet, which is a lot more difficult to handle. It takes longer to burn, um, you know, it piles up. So I guess the, if, if the board wishes to collect and dispose of limbs larger than four inches by four feet, we have to come up with a system to, to collect and dispose of that debris and the same with construction debris. And there's a very specific um, definition of construction debris. It doesn't include things like carpet. It does not include bulky items. It's not appliances. It's a list of very specific construction materials like um, roofing shingles, gypsum, concrete, um, you know, big, big tree trunks, things like that. So, you know, we, we do have to remember that we still have to address that issue, which is what we've been trying to address for a couple of years um, because it's, you know, it's been difficult to come to a solution. Um, but I, I did want to clarify, we can take the smaller limbs. That's not the issue. It's the large limbs that are outside of that size limit that we have to come to a conclusion of how we want to address if we just don't want to take them and people must bring smaller pieces. Um, <clears throat> you know, they would have to bring us much, much smaller um, piece, you know, limb pieces, or you may not want us to handle them at all. And that's not considered residential. Oh. Then we talk about potentially unmanned sites. 
they looking at other man's eyes. I'm not really probably couldn't do probably couldn't do Carlton and Dean Hatchie and uh, maybe Harrison yeah. Blue, but maybe some of the other sites would be in unmanned sites. So I would think that would take a design change, obviously. You know, we could not have the hills and the large containers and all that. It would basically be sites with what size containers are they? Twelve yard. Um, like Madison County sites there on 14. Right. You had to walk up and forth in the one end of the container. Oh yeah, of course right. we would. I think we did that. I think we would have to look at the three sites. I mean, potentially the three sites that are manned sites, but if we're going to you know, take in C and D, that would probably be you know, one of those or so. It may have to be that that location. And and that's what we had originally started discussing, and then obviously we. We had to set that aside so we could finish the study and and pass the ordinance and now we're coming back to it but i i the only question i have about unmanned sites is how do we how do we prevent abuse at those sites you could they'd have they'd have they'd have lot big long light bulbs loaded in there paint um oil, tires batteries it, it, it'd be well, I wouldn't even know how to restrict it to only those folks who pay the assessment mm -hmm. if they're unmanned. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be such a point of contention that, um, you know, that would concern me a little bit, how we could monitor that. I, I don't know how we could. You have a mess on unmanned sites that can if you're a mess. Um, commissioners, Commissioner, I apologize. I don't know if you're a Taylor County resident, uh, native. Or not? Uh, you are. When I got here in 2000, we had eight manned sites and one unmanned site, which was Erie Dale. And it was during our tenure that the board decided we needed to uh, man Erie Dale. At the same time, when I got here, for those of you that are certainly, and I say this with respect, old timers, you remember there were at least four other roll off sites in this county that were not. That were closed. Sure. Right. Still, there's still four hills around this county that I'm aware of um, that were used. So when you're talking about consolidation, change is hard, but evidently the commission at that time made that decision to close four of them. Uh, one, the infamous white elephant on San Pedro, I think that's Miss Pam's district. Um, and there was one in Boyd, there was one down that road that goes from 19 to the Kelly beach road. Kelly, Kelly, Kelly Gray. No, Kelly Gray. Kelly, Kelly Gray. Gray. And there was one in Boyd. Old Puckett Road, Frank Water Intersection. There, there were, there there were a number of them, but I, I, would, I would contend that those also were closed with the understanding that these that remain are in locations to strategically be able to break the mileage so that the residents can use those and get the true benefit. Oh, I don't disagree with you. I'm just giving you a little sure. history about sure. change is hard. Mm -hmm. And when I also got here, we were open 365 days a year. <clears throat> Interim uh, manager at that time, Barbara Bratcher, brought it to the board that we were going to close on Thanksgiving and Christmas. And I will tell you the first two years that we did that, especially at Harrison Blue, Gary sure knows, were pure hell, but once we got past that, we did. We seemed to do okay. So just as you consider these things, nobody likes change. I don't like it. I'm probably the biggest stick in the mud there ever was. But <laughs> it's it's whatever your thinking is. Keep that kind of stuff in mind. We've done it. We've done it before. The day after um, Thanksgiving, no, the day after Christmas, the first year we closed, my mechanic and I went out to Harrison Blue, of course, of all places. The garbage was lined up from the compactor all the way out to the roadway, all the way down, and it took Lloyd and I an hour and a half to compact everything that was on the ground, but we got past it. That's just history, gentlemen. It's almost impossible with the system we got here and what people used to, to have one man fight anytime in the future. I, I, I think you'd be inviting a lot of life to have on that side. Yeah. They'd be backing up to the hill and throwing it over and getting well, the back of the truck, shoveling it out of the truck like right. they do it. 
It would have to be a different, a totally different design. Right. Really be lined up out by the fence is what that is pretty much what would happen there. Right. Yeah. And close the hills off where they can't even drive up. Right. And people all around the county go to businesses and, and put them in their way pro can now. Some people just go right down there to the 7-Eleven's got a way pro can and they throw their garbage in that. I mean, I see it in a lot of different places. People at Airport Capitol Hall, we got a way pro behind the, the building there. And they build it up, I mean, you know, sometimes, you know, it just, it's going to go somewhere. I mean, when they leave the house with it, then they're not going to care about it, you know. And I would say, you know, the thing to keep in mind that, you know, when you reduce hours, again, what you're saving is your, your hourly labor, and that's, that's the extent of it. So it's somewhere around $14 an hour for every hour that you close a site, unless I'm missing something. I mean, that's really the only, the only cost saving and, and <coughs> potentially overtime. You know, if, if, um, if we could cut down on overtime, that's a potential savings of $25,000 a year based upon the last fiscal year, what mm -hmm. we spent. And that's just from having to staff these sites with full-time employees who are willing to, to work the sites. If you cut them, if you just took the sites and had every other day open, people would get used to it. They just know every other day the site was on the go. Mm -hmm. I mean, that would, that would be, I know, I think that would be a big savings, you know, so every other day. Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday? That's what I would think if you were going to do that. Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. But maybe have them open longer hours? Well, I mean, seven to seven, you know. Just to make sure everyone has an opportunity. To get there. But not do eight to seven. I, don't, I mean, some may get there early, I guess, but. I or even if they open 10 hours. I guess seven to seven, folks could run by the dock on the way to work. Mm -hmm. Still gonna have the same amount of garbage going, but it just be open half the time every other day. You know, you've got sites open seven days a week. I mean, it cuts it, cuts it down. You know. Now, Gary, do you think that we would, if if the sites were closed for any amount of time, would we be able to keep up with moving those containers around like we need to? Could we stage extra containers just in case? I mean, we'd almost have to do that, wouldn't we? Yeah, and we, we kind of do that now on weekends or three day, we have a holiday in there or whatever. We, we've we got pretty decent at that staging. We're challenged a little bit with having extra cans to do it with every site, but mm -hmm. we've got, we've been fortunate we haven't been, you know. But we would almost know which sites would need. I mean, if we would need additional cans. That's what we kind of do now. We just place them on the hill like they may have three instead of two. Mm -hmm. We put one in the middle trying to. For your household. We could have sites that would just like cross and be open seven days a week and then some sites, you know, every other day or half a day, you know, whatever. Yeah. Would it throw you off with your, with your drivers if you was working every other day? I mean, that'd be a. It probably wouldn't, but we, we'd stagger them. There's probably other stuff. They'd probably be busy enough to work a regular shift. You know what I'm saying? Right. If you hit Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, we know that would be the heavy days. They would still be probably pulling on Tuesday. Like Carlton, for example, uh, yesterday he pulled four cans, and the four cans, every time he brought a can, there was another one full. What I'm saying... He couldn't stay up. He had the same amount of full cans when he got done that that day. Andrew, he he had the same amount of cans. He started out with let's say six full ones. When he got done at the end of the day, he had one empty and up five full. That's how fast they were bringing it in. So if if he was off, if that site was closed Tuesday, for example, he could pull Tuesday and get caught back up. He would he. I have to 
send somebody down there to help him, and he'll catch up probably around Thursday from what we they had from the weekend and what's coming in this week. So he can pull on his on the off day that the mm -hmm. side is yes. like if it was yes, open Tuesday, right. Thursday, and Saturday, he could the driver could pull yeah, money yes, right. if he still can yes. catch up money ready to drive. Besides that, you know, they got recycle cans, tire cans, metal mm -hmm. cans, you know, there's a lot more going on in the county. But you know, you could taper back. I mean, you could figure it out. It wouldn't take long, a couple of weeks. You'd figure out, you know, get some rhythm on it, see what you need to do. So you were gonna mention something about a trial, doing a trial. Um, yes. So um I still think it may be, are, are you talking about the, the waste stream study? Uh, you said you were going to talk, you and Gary talk about a trial. So I think what that is referring to is the, the, the one week waste stream study at Osceola when you can spare an employee. I think that would give us a good idea of, of what composition of our waste stream is C and D or is, you know, some limbs end up at a cellar, right? Um, what's household, what's, you know, we would have a better idea of what's really going into the site. And um, I mean, I don't know that it will change the tonnage necessarily, but I think it would help us prepare um, for what volume of C and D we're really taking in. Um, at the end of the day, because when, you know, what we're looking at is compacted versus not compacted. And there's numerous reasons that it may not be compacted, and we can't assume that that is all one particular material. We don't know what it is. So as far as trying to plan for, um, for charging for C&D, I think it would be helpful to know what percentage of our volume really even meets that criteria. And, you know, and I don't know what can be in a mixed load. I mean, if someone pulls up with a trailer full of material, there could be something, you know, at the bottom of the pile that the attendant doesn't even see. And that would give us a little bit of an idea of the percentage of our tonnage you know what that would be as far as C and D versus household versus you know limbs or whatever else ends up at the site, and that's something that we can plan as soon as we can break somebody free. Yeah, you know we talk about the weekends uh, through the week. My mechanic and the people in my office are running roll off sites too. Mm -hmm. Like I don't, I don't have <laughs> like. A mechanic maybe once a week. And, uh, you need to study at the landfill. At the landfill. So just yeah, a contractual service week. Landfill facility. Five, six. Well, what would I mean? Yeah. Design it. I can. Okay. Okay. That's just the one. That first five in Cross City. They must have luck with that. They do it. You know, they bring their cans there. Is that right? Gary, yeah, they put them, they dump them all out and then sort yeah. of stuff. They and, use inmate labor for that too. Yeah. And I don't know. When that labor they use, is that something they pay for through the state on, or is that county uh, well, trustees? Or? No, I believe it's from DOC. And, um, but you have to remember, we can only have two, we can only have a total of three work squads within the county. Two of them, we already contract out and then the city has a work squad. They will not, so DOC will not give us another squad. That's just. So that, that's not on the plate doing transfer plate, man, really. If, we're, if, we would tra if we would staff it with inmate labor, I think, I mean, I think that's how Dixie County um, is able to utilize their, their site and they don't, expend any more funds than they do because they staff it with inmate labor. So, um, and I, they have a scale. They do, they charge on some material. Right. 
But I believe, from what I understand, now some counties do take small amounts of dry, bulky materials. <clears throat> so again, you know, if someone if someone pulls up to a site, and we look at our current ordinance, and they have they have you know small limbs, palm fronds, things like that, that would not need to go to the trans transfer station. So we're we're really talking about when we talk about things like limbs, we're talking about anything bigger than four inches by four feet. So, and it's difficult for me to know the percentage of the small versus the large. Um, and do we do we really want to handle that? Um, and I, it's hard for me to predict, um, you know, what folks would do with that material or if it's, you know, or how often a resident would even generate that type of material. Uh, if we're saying limbs and leaves, basically four inches. Four inches by four, four feet foot. is considered yard trash. And that doesn't account for a 12 inch or 18 inch block that's four foot as far as a tree. The limbs themselves is, is what I'm saying. Not if I took four down inches a tree. By four, right. So I would have to accommodate for the tree trunk itself. If I were to cut down a tree, I'd have to process the yes. limbs that are smaller than four inches right. into four foot lengths. And then the bark or the main trunk of the tree wouldn't be accepted at the real long side. Right. And I went to the, I sent Mr. Wong a picture of the day. I took a picture of the sign leaves and limbs. <coughs> And then I put the camera over in the dumpster. It had a few limbs. Mm -hmm. It had metal. It had five gallon buckets. Mm -hmm. It had toys. It had stacks of uh, carpet and this clean. Yeah, I mean, and that whole background, you got to have somebody up standing up on a hill mm -hmm. to man the hill to say, no, that goes in that one. Just you know, I see some metal goes over there in this number three or whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's really no way to. <laughs> Without sorting it again and with all that labor, you never have a, a clean load. You know, I mean, there's, there's no way that I've had everything under the sun in that one picture I've seen. But, so that would be, that would just go in as household garbage. If it's small. Right. Um, I mean, it would be, we would be charged for class one household, household garbage, and right. you have to remember that with our present rebate and i don't know if that ever changes or not i'm i'm not sure but that is that translates into about 21 dollars a ton versus 34 if we if we separated the household the class one from the class three so really you're coming out ahead calling it all class one we are money wise because the rebate's only offered on the class one. And let them dump everything they want to in that, that class one thing, you might well say. Right. So I think when it becomes an issue is when a metal bin is, you know, contaminated or um, if it's limbs that could have gone to the incinerator but now have to go to the landfill is when it, I mean, it's still an issue, but I, I don't know that there's any value now in separating the class one and the class three, which I'm assuming is why we've done it that way for so long. I think if you got them down to four foot length and four inches of size on the limbs, you'd, you'd have a lot more weight in the containers when you haul them. To, you know, I mean that, but you hauling that out to burn. But then again, what what happens when you get the limbs out of gear and you got a trap in it, back of trash? We have to dig it out. You dig it out? Yeah, DEP will eat, eat you up if they come out there and see that. We got a container out there. We, we dig it out and throw it into a yeah. container. We got to sort through it sometimes. So that labor is sort through it, even though you got to sort through, it, sort through every load goes out there anyway. They don't, we look at it, but sometimes they'll have treated lumber. The people think you can burn it, they'll throw it right in with the limbs. You know, like a two before, whatever, you can't burn that. Can I ask a question? If you had this, I guess this is called mixed use, what you're talking about. So if you had, uh, say you had a little bit of um, 
felt so garbage and, and then somebody comes in and puts their limbs in and they're all crossed and and so it actually fills up the canister but there's lots of space in between so in terms of the trips that we make and the cost of, of the trips is, is this i mean well so let me let me catch you up so we did a test where we um crushed or compacted loads that had like gary they had like furniture and yeah, just bulky exactly. materials yeah. we were able to double you know pretty much double the, the weight of the load and when we looked at the math today unless i'm you know unless i'm looking at it incorrectly um compacting a load based upon the tonnage at carlton cemetery would only save us about ten thousand dollars a year so what we were discussing is, you know, is it worth going through the, the cost to hire someone, the cost of equipment, fuel, if you're not going to realize that much of a cost savings? And, you know, I, I don't, I think we would have to try to devise a way to compact loads at every site for really to be, to really realize more of a cost savings. So that 10,000, was that just for one roll-off savings at one roll-off? That was, that was something that we figured at Carlton Cemetery, which is a very busy site. So based upon the current tonnage there um, and, and assuming that half of the tonnage there is not compacted um, and the other half is compacted because that's about how it turned out in the study, right, Gary? It was about half and half. Um, and then, you know, we had to compact it five times to get that weight up to almost six tons. <clears throat> so it brought the weight from an average of about three tons to hopefully about six tons. And so really, so, so where your savings would be is that mileage going back and forth to the landfill. So from, that's about 60 miles. And we figured that our cost per mile just for the vehicle and the associated vehicle costs, it's about two dollars and fifty cents a mile. Now that's not you know your your administration costs and your utilities and all your overhead and all that. That's just what's associated with the vehicle. And these are, I mean, we're we're just trying to make some projections. So if you had that at, and you were able to move that equipment to say three sites, um, you would just double that number as far as your projected savings but then would we need to hire someone and spend more than what we would save okay so the ten thousand dollars did not account for the labor that you would need to to oh, okay so that's not clear um i hate to use the word profit but you know what i'm saying savings savings yeah. right. so um and I'm not, I hope that was where you were going with your question. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. I'm sorry I was late, y'all. I totally forgot about this meeting, to be honest with you. I've been out in my yard having so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we did talk about, um, just, just so you know, we, um, I've looked at an RFP of a surrounding county and for curbside pickup, and we have some concerns with that. I don't know if our present assessment would cover what it would cost for curbside service, because from what Gary and I recollect, the last time we got a little bit of an estimate maybe to do that, it was over, it, it was not, it would have cost our residents more. And so that would do a current um, um, survey to see how much it would cost now? Well, I don't know how to do that and make it apples to apples because I looked at Suwannee County. They have not awarded the bid yet. And I believe there is another city and a county that are, are probably going to go out to bid soon. I think I need to get more information before I can really compare apples to apples because, um, say, Suwannee County, they have 16,500 households. 
we only have about 9,300 or 9,400 who pay the assessment. And we have a very large county. So, so where I think the, um, what drives the cost is probably density. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what I recall before, that that was a consideration because, you know, there's only several areas where people, you know, say Steen Hatchie, where you have that density. Well, so if you have a big county, fewer residents, I don't know that you can truly compare the cost. I'm afraid that, I'm afraid it would cost more than what our current assessment is, but that's just an assumption I'm making based upon what I'm afraid would drive the cost. And our assessment, even though it's higher than it used to be, it's still substantially lower than say Swanee County. I think Swanee County is at 225, something like that. And that's why I call garbage only, isn't it? That's for household. Yes, for household. I call garbage only for 225. I believe so. I don't, I don't, well, no, I don't know. So I better not, not speak out of time. I know they got I don't know what the city is. I think Swanee's the same. I think they, I'd have to look and see. Do they it. charge, are they just household? I they don't so. accept anything but household? I don't think they do either. But remember, for, you know, but remember, for us, household is, anything but the specific materials in C and D and limbs over four inches by four feet. So, you know, I'm having a hard time really um, determining how, how much material that is at the end of the day. Could, um, I guess, could we, you know, go out for bids and see what it would, would cost? I mean, there's, would that hurt anything just to see what what kind of price somebody would give us? I don't know that it would it it might hurt people's feelings if if that's something y'all if the assumption was that there would be mandatory curbside service, but that's something that I mean I think as long as it was made clear that um, we're you know we're just kind of testing the waters, but if we make that clear, I don't know how many proposals will actually receive if that's the understanding going into it. I don't know that companies will will want to spend the time to submit a proposal. And and I'm just well, who knows? I mean I, I'm just you know thinking so, through the process. Right. Well. But it, it, it might, you know, if the prices were right, it might turn into something for somebody. Yeah. But of course if it's not, then it wouldn't. So I guess that's a, a risk. But then again, you've still got the problem of what you're going to do with all that other. Well, and that's that's something that I think we could um, we could customize our a, a request for proposals to include, you know, a, that service for, uh, you know, they would operate a site to accept the larger limbs in the C and D or the bulky materials, because you have to remember the curbside service is only what you can put in a can. It has to be bad garbage in a can. So there has to be some way for folks to be able to dispose of refrigerators, stoves, metal, you know, everything else, couches, chairs, all that. So I, I do think that we could include in our RFP um, that they must operate, you know, however many sites um, for, for that type of disposal. But then I don't, but then I think there would be an additional charge to those folks. Yeah, and I, I kind of, I, I mean, I'm thinking that if I was going to uh, submit a bit of something like this, that it would have sort of the same guidelines as we've got. I wouldn't want to pick up four or five pine trees on the side of the road that have been that have been cut up, you know. So, right. so, and then we can customize once a week, twice a week, but there's got to be some way to, you know, for people to dispose of things that don't fit in a can. It's on the curb because that's that's really the challenge now. And I don't I don't know how many of our services um, offer anything other than the bag the bag garbage in the can. Mm -hmm. But I, I what I'd like to do. Um, if the board agrees, is 
try to get my hand, try to obtain some other RFPs of surrounding counties that I believe are going to be advertised soon and really take a look at, because I think it would be more relevant. I don't mm -hmm. want to use old information and that's why I didn't use old information because I don't think the prices would be the, change, the same mm -hmm. with the minimum wage mandate and the, the yeah. cost of fuel and everything else. So I think that if we continue to try to gather that information and I can really take a look at what counties comparable to us, if they award the bid, what's the amount, how, how that works out, that we'll have some relevant information and then maybe can decide if you wish to advertise for that same proposal. Have y'all talked about any other options other than roadside? If you have, I'll catch up with you later. I don't want to waste everybody else's time. Um, Tell them about the one somebody suggest maybe closing some sites. And so there was a discussion of so um, you had requested that I provide the numbers, and these are all rough estimates. If we closed every site one day a week. And that looks like it projects to a cost savings of approximately $60,000 a year. Now, the last time we, we talked, um, we had looked at closing six sites, I believe. One day a week, is it six? And that was about $40,000. So if we close you know, nine sites one day a week, that would be $60,000. And then if you close nine sites two days a week, you would double that number. Mm -hmm. So then there was a discussion of some of the sites with a lower volume and the potential to, you know, are there any sites that could, could we consolidate some of the sites? Could any of the sites be closed? And the sites with the, the three sites with the lowest volume were Giridoo, Salem, and 9814. And so then the discussion was, okay, well, do y'all want to consider reducing the hours? Do you want to consider closing any of those sites? I think the two sites that are closest to each other now are Eridu and Shady Grove. And, you know, Salem is kind of out in a remote area, 9814. Those folks would have to come probably all the way to Carlton Cemetery would be the closest roll-off site. I think the folks at Salem would have a similar challenge. They would either have to come to town or to Blue Springs, Steenhatchee, or come to town because of they're, they're in kind of an outlying area. So the, the only site I think that is geographically close to another site is Iridu, and that's within a few miles of Shady Grove, right? And that's a low volume site. So you would potentially save just the just the labor. Now, you how know, closing it, how, what did you discuss of closing that? D days or part of part, huh? So closing a period, right? Well, they, we talked about a lot of different things. Uh, yeah. But that, you know, just in the discussion, that site is really the only one that's physically, you know, geographically close to another site. And maybe the board could, could consider. But, you know, there are three sites that have low volume. And um, Salem, I think, is, three day, is open three days a week now. 98.14 is four days a week. And Eridu is three. So it's not a tremendous cost savings because they, they aren't open that many hours. Now, where we could potentially save money is in overtime mm -hmm. because uh, the last fiscal year, we spent almost $25,000 in overtime. Mm -hmm. We have a chronic shortage of roll-off site attendance. We have, and we're underutilizing some of our staff because we have a mechanic working a roll-off site. We have the secretary working a roll-off site. You know, we we are really struggling with trying to keep these sites open, and that's when the discussion was, okay, well, you know, if there was a if there was one day we could close, Sunday might give us some relief because that's typically the day we struggle with staffing and have to pay overtime. Okay, so what 
with um, you, say using the, the secretary when you had to, what what impact has that had? What kind of negative impact has that had on the organization? Well, then that leaves. <laughs> well, so I think Gary's been basically filling the mechanics job responsibilities. And right. And so that leaves one person in the office. And if she's doing other duties, then you know, people have to leave a, a message. There's no one there to answer the phone, which isn't a tremendous, I don't think there's been a tremendous impact, but it makes it, it has an impact. Well, well, I don't think impact. about if you, you know, if you want to uh, continue to pay for somebody to be there just to answer the phone, which I know they don't answer it all the time anyway, or just, you know, at the end of the day, Give yourself time to catch all those messages and get back with everybody. I mean, I think that's that's not all they do, though. They uh, they got to enter stuff. They got to make scheduling. They do payroll. It's, there's a lot more involved. Well, because remember, the reason that we asked the board to approve that secretary position was so that our superintendent could be our mosquito control, um, take over the mosquito control duties. So we did quite a bit of shifting of responsibilities and thank goodness that she's been able to step in and help with, you know, other departments and environmental services or excuse me, solid waste being one of them, because it's just kind of worked out as far as the seasons. But I don't think that's the best long term solution is to is to especially for the mechanic. I mean, we don't we would rather have that person fulfilling the job duties of a mechanic rather than working in a roll-off site. Um, but that's that's just one example. Um, so so the board understands, you know, some of the struggles we've had with filling those positions. And especially with the cost of fuel now, I think that, isn't that just about the biggest complaint we get? So we have people who only want to work a site close to their home because fuel being so expensive, they don't want to drive to Steenhatchee or you know some of the or wherever. But sometimes it's impossible to, you know, to make that work out. I, I think they try to accommodate that, but it just doesn't always work. And so people really, that's why we have some issues with our call-ins because if they live north of town, they don't want to drive to Steenhatchee, and I don't. I don't really blame them. I don't know that they really make much money by the time they go back and forth to Steenhatchee with today's fuel prices. Well, it, it's just their, their salary is so low anyway. Have you ever thought about um, maybe uh, their, pay their mileage? I don't know if, I mean, they even Every employee we had had to drive to one mileage if we started that. I'm talking about if you drove from north of town to St. Hatching. I'm not talking about if you drove from Irida to Shady Grove or, but yeah, I mean, 98 so long way. So well, I'm just, you know, thinking outside the box. Is that is that cheaper than overtime? Has anybody uh, calculated that to see? No, because, I mean, the closest we come to that is I do know that, um, like, if we have boat ramp attendants who work on the weekends, they they drive to the road department and they use a vehicle to go to the boat ramp. But there's usually more than one person, and you know, it's several of them. Um, but it's not comparable to Eridu to Steenhatchee. And I don't, I don't know. I mean, we could look at that and see, but we would have to have some pretty stringent guidelines on when that would be um <coughs> yeah. well if you you know if you went back to the sixty thousand dollar savings for closing every one of them one day so would that be staggered which day that they would be closed so that and again if you did that thinking you could make up for your staff shortage then it may entail driving a long ways but was that going to be closed everybody on the same day or we, we discussed so several options were discussed one of them was just closing on sundays because that seems to be comparable with what other counties offer mm -hmm. and that is a little bit of a challenge as far as keeping the sites open on sundays as far as getting people to work 
Then the other, I think, where we were maybe left to um, was maybe having the sites open every other day. Um, instead of seven days a week, having them open Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. And I don't know if that's something that could be staggered. So, you know, on any given day, there might be a site open, but it may not be, you know, the one closest to someone's home. Yeah, I, don't, I, I'm, I don't know that if I'm in favor of Sundays, because if you think about people that go to the beach for the weekend and they do. I would think that they would go by and, and uh, dump their garbage before they head back to Georgia, wherever they're going. Same thing with 98. Um, you know, people go down there and hunt and for the weekend. And are they going to, I mean, it's just a thought. Well, I know that during scallop season, um, that, I mean, that's why we have the the, the Blue Springs site open at 10. After scallop season, the site doesn't even open on Sundays until two o'clock. But during that busiest time, yes, I mean, it's open at 10. To try to accommodate those folks, I think, who are leaving town. So they can stop, drop off their trash before they head out. But I know I also, you know, when we were receiving a lot of feedback about changing the assessment, that seemed to be a complaint I heard over and over is the site's not open when we leave. Maybe they leave early in the morning, I don't know. But it's not open when I want to use it anyway. So, and now I have to, you know, that was some of the um, frustration. Can you do uh, some kind of quality control, sort of um, something that would with each site of when are they the busiest and which day of which day are they least busy so that you know before if we really did think about doing that then we would have some data that would say yes we've you know we, we right. know which, which which day is the slowest is that something that we we can't really tell that by the the um ticket schedule they'd have to count the cars you know how many comes in and just do a like a quality control study yeah. at least you've got something you've got data when people start fussing you know you you've got some data they got some data on how many camps leave there each, at each site uh gary does he has some data you know the actual how many cans leave from each side? I've seen it. Mr. Warner's got a list of how many cans leave each side. You know, Does that tell you how busy they are, though? Yep. Yep. But the, well, the busy still the can. I mean, you know, I mean. Unless somebody takes a lot of stuff and puts it in there. Right. I don't know. I'm just asking the question. I mean, we can do that. I mean, we can ask each attendant to tally, um, you know, how, how, how many cars come in. Did I miss anything? <laughs> in my review, did I miss anything? <laughs> People could live with the site being open every other day. You know, a lot of people only go twice a week anyway to the dump site. Some people go three times. You know, the city, how many, they pick it up twice a week or once a week? Twice a week. And they actually charge more than we do. And they only pick up twice a week. You kind of prepare for that, you know, what's your day. And uh, so, you know, you get your garbage out there, or either it's not it's not taken that day. What about the limbs that they, you pile out there? I see them picking them up with a you grab them. That is once a month. Yes, once a month. Once a month. Once a month. So in other words, we get limbs every day. And they pick them up only once a month for more money. You know. So, John, how much you how much is the assessment for the city? I'm sorry to bring my notes with me. I think it's. It's about $33 a month. Sir? About $33 a month. That's what I thought. 21 something 
for yeah. garbage and then 11 or 12 for landfill. So what would you say 33, Commissioner, times 12? There you go. That's curbside. That's curbside. In a small compacted area. Wow. And they, I think if you leave a big tree trunk laying out there and they have to cut it up and get it there, they charge extra too. Well, I, I, what I've been seeing those people are cutting them big tree trunks up and have a dump stuff there. And they take do take brush and lens, small lens. Yeah. But they don't take the big trunks. Now, if you put a flower pot out there or a concrete block or something, they'll pick it up and put it over to the side. They won't take it with the uh, lens. If you put a hot water heater or a stove out there, they'll pick that up. Which well, is people in the community come by and get that. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, I know. Shreds and Recycle Center and sell it. You come in yell and get it. You know, while you sleep. Is that what we want to do as a car count at these sites and then maybe look at what kind of savings we would say the savings we would see in opening three days a week making two to thursday saturday okay. is that what to do two to one thursday three days a week we're talking two open days open Wednesday, Friday, what about Monday, Wednesday, Friday? Right. Two to Thursday, Saturday. You'd almost have to be open on Saturday. You'd have to be open on the weekend. Mm -hmm. So, and also, okay. I think we're talking hours from 7 to 7. I, I mean, that was just a suggestion just to <clears throat> accommodate um, people who may need to drop off before work or after work. If we even, if, and I don't know if 12 hours is the best number, 10 may, I don't know. What do you think, Gary? Well, like Carlton, it's open, you know, basically. Well, right, you know, now daylight saving times, it's open from seven to six, but through the heavy season, spring, summer, it's seven to seven. And uh, there's a few people come in before eight o'clock. I've been down there. Jim probably seen them too. And uh, I think it's people going to work, like to the mill or something like that. If they come mm -hmm. in. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> probably even look at, you know, cost saving then if we did consolidate the Erdu site and push those folks to Shady Grove. I don't know if I want to close it all the way. What? what four miles down the road or something? Let's get the data. Let's let's get the data on with our quality control study and see see where we're at with all of them. Now, what do we have y'all just did y'all discuss uh, these contractors and people bringing carpet in from backcocks and places like that? Mm -hmm. No, I think, um, no, I think that's been addressed. Have you gotten any feedback after you sent that memo out? We've called the people coming with signs, is you know, bucket in there. <clears throat> So, so basically, um, you know, we Gary has circulated memos about checking cards and had employees sign off on it to make sure everybody understands what the expectations are. But after um, we received a complaint of a contractor dropping carpet off at a site, um, we Gary sent out a memo that basically read that if if even if someone has a card if they have a marked vehicle that identifies them at a contractor that they are not allowed to enter the site unless they have just household garbage i mean if they have a sack of garbage that's obviously from their home that's different and then uh, further and then uh, i believe it said later on in the memo that even if their vehicle is not marked and they have materials that would indicate that they're a contractor, that they should be questioned. And when not you say contractor, does that mean a tree surgeon or does that mean any business owner? Anybody that pulls in there that's doing a business. So if I'm advertising something that's not generating solid waste 
and that is my personal vehicle was that if they say there if it comes in say like we're uh I don't know, uh, builder, roofer, stuff like that. Right. No, I'm talking about somebody that has a, a, a shop, a business that sells. Well, you know, in reality, garbage. they shouldn't be in there if they are. Right. But they're having the household garbage. Household garbage. We don't. We don't argue with. Right. Uh, we'll talk to you afterwards. Because I, I do believe, after your discussions, that there have been sites that have questioned people. That aren't bringing in, you know, C and D or limbs. Really, they were suggested to remove their sticker off their personal vehicle because they had a magnet or, or something on their their vehicle about their business. It's not generating commercial garbage. It was it was a vehicle was personal, their only vehicle. Well, unlike say on that paper, it specifies a bit, you know, household garbage. Yeah, they can dump automatically. Yeah, they are not. I'm not saying it's going to be foolproof. I mean, no, I just think we've got to be practical. I mean, if I've got a bag of trash and I've well, got a magnet can, on my door that says they can call me to do laundry, it doesn't mean that I'm, I'm bringing in a you know boatload of laundry to dump in the dumpster. And, and, we, and we talked to the roll off attendants, told them, say, if a guy pulls up there, he's got signs on, he's putting household trash in there, it's fine. No matter if he's got a question, call me. Just call me and we'll. The guy get on the phone, you know, we'll talk, whatever. And usually it's easy, you know, just easy fix. We're not, we're not trying to stop people from bringing in household trash. And I know people that are contractors, but they got a house too and pay the assessment. Sure. They should have a right to get in there too. What we're trying to curb is people coming in, you know, just abusing it with them. That's the other day. That's the other day. Uh, what you reference to was a church that changed all their carpet. Mm -hmm. And Badcock sold us the carpet. The church, the gentleman that did the carpet for Badcock had installed it. He doesn't have a sign on his truck as a contract. He does not. He just got a he just got a regular pickup truck. He filed all the carpet from the church in the pickup, all of it to the side and shedding group. And um, he has. He lives in the county. He he could legally haul a truckload of up there to the shop, you know. Sure. But you know, he couldn't carry it to Greenville. But it was easier to go to church because he was right there in Shady Grove at the church, so he went right down there and done it. I went to Bad Doc myself and talked to the owner and said, "Would you please tell your contractors from now on if you do a commercial job?" Tell them to carry it to Greenville. And, she, and the lady said they would. And I just, I did that on my own just because that's what needs to happen. And she needed to understand what, what the situation she was putting us in, the county, and all the people for the county. But if he don't have a sign, there's no way of Gary's people to know that he's a contractor. He could bring three truck loads of carpet up there from a the church and nobody knows him. I don't know any difference. So they have to just let them let them dump it. They can't just look at the load and say, well, you look like this is a contractor, y'all. You know, but they can't. Uh, I think that's what he's saying that the memo you stated was to ask. Yeah, just, uh, yeah. But I think he, he, yeah, he asked them to ask them, you know, that's what he did. Yeah. But you're going to end up with some of that no matter what, you know, because you got all kinds of people around town. You got painters, you got sheetrock people, they don't have signs on the truck. <laughs> Once they catch I don't have a problem with that, but I think they also generate household trash. So there are cases that they have a reason to be at that site. They're paying the assessment as well. We're not trying to keep yeah. those people away, but it's very hard to. <laughs> it, it's, it, it's almost impossible to police that completely. You just do the best you can with it. Right. I saw a fellow dumping a bunch of tile. Talking about the trailer of the tile, busted tile, concrete pieces, and all that. It had to then come out of a motel or a swimming pool or something. It was, I mean, a trailer load of tile. Uh, but, you know, he was, and I put, I did the coffin and I questioned, I said, You're a contractor? He said, I lay tile. You know, and I didn't ask you where he got that from or who he was laying tile for, but he had a trailer load of tile. 
cases, he do all kinds of stuff. But, you know, I just asked him whether he was going back to he said he was. That's what he did for a living. You know, but that's before Gary had mentioned to the people to ask him. You know, that was several months ago. Well, I think this is just common sense for whoever's working at the law. If it's household garbage and they've got a, a sticker or a card, they get a dump. But if they've got any C and D, I think that I don't believe there's anything wrong to ask them if they're a contractor, if they're working for somebody else. They try to identify those people. And that's, I believe, what the memo said. It's just, but, you know, I think it's going to be, it's going, it's a learning curve and it's not going to be perfect. And something that Gary and I have discussed is someone may accidentally, you know, get turned away. And that's why all they have to do is call if there's any question. And, you know, just like what he's talking about, if, if this person shows back up again with such as that, then you know that he's, he's, you know, that's part of his job as a contractor. But they're, they're all, you might want to think about, you know, they'll get smart and they'll say, well, next time I'm going to Harrison Blue. And you've got to have a way, maybe, with communication that you've had John Doe that went to Carlton and he had a load of tall and this is his vehicle and everything and just uh, and everybody at the real loss know that this is a person to be looking for, maybe, I, I, you know. Well, and that's why we said, even if the vehicle isn't marked, just, just ask them. And I think we'll get to a point where we're able to maybe a little easier identify. Um, they, they had caught a few people in the last week or so, because they called and said, maybe getting a call from this guy, but he told me he was a contractor. I sent him on down the road. So it's, it's well, working. Them. Get into the wording, and once they ask if they're a contractor a couple of times, they're gonna come in doing the same thing and ask them they're a contractor. They're gonna say no. Well, you'll 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 soon identify these people though. Yeah, well, what are you gonna do? What, what are they gonna do when they say no? What are they gonna do? Just tell them they can't do it anyway. Well, that's why we need another mechanism to deal with C and D right. and and these large limbs. <coughs> so it's not. It's not just <clears throat> trying to keep contractors out, but we need a way to to generate revenue to collect and dispose of construction debris and, and large limbs. And then, and, and because residents, I mean, we should not, from what I understand, we should not be using the revenue from the residential assessment to collect and dispose of any C and D, whether it's a resident or it's a contractor. We just haven't quite gotten to the point where we've been able to come up with a good way to handle that. Would you say we could say no more C and D at all? And it would be legal to do that, isn't that right, Mr. Conrad? <clears throat> and I mean that would be a I know at Lake City that at their trans transfer station, if you come in there and you have a mixed load like C and D or whatever, uh, I think they charge you like a hundred dollars a ton just to drop that in there. And that curbs them from coming in there with that. It stops it at that point. Do you know if? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I said, we just couldn't tell them no. I mean, we'd have stuff laid all over this county. Well, we didn't want to see any. Yeah. I mean, I think the other thing is just start with one transfer station of what we would need to do. Have one drop location, and whether it was Carlton or just 10 acres that Mr. Moody mentioned earlier. You go every night and then you clean it. Maybe clean it up every day is what they would be looking at. You'd have to have a you'd have to have a slab to dump that stuff on where they could take the front end loaders and loaders and start digging into the dirt. You know. And there's 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 a slab at the airport that's not being used for anything when the mold slabs. Uh you know, would be a, I don't know. 
But then that turns into would FAA let us use that? I don't think so. Airport for a for a for a I don't think so. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't <laughs> I don't think that's an option. We're pretty um, specific about what we cannot do. We get in trouble for asking. Yeah. <laughs> so, possibility is there in respect to the tonnage for C and D and the cost. I mean, are, are we anywhere closer to understanding if we were to accept that, um, the, the cost that would be affiliated with it? Unless, unless we can get that study done over there and get a percentage and. I think that's what we need the, to really. I don't know how accurate the percentage would be if he did a week's. It, it'd probably give you some idea. It probably closed, you know, if it's saying 30% C and D and then loads, that'd give you an idea what you're up. You know, we could <clears> run a tonnage and just, you know, multiply it out with 30%, look at it. Come well, on. I think it, it would be more acceptable to have that option if you were to pay for it versus just, oh, you've got to transfer it to X location. I mean, I, for me, I would rather have the option, even if I had to pay a little bit for it, <laughs> versus not having the option at all and have to go an hour one way with fuel costs on the rise. Well, the other option is you, you folks could rent a container. Right. So if I have that kind of quantity, yes. But if I only have, if, if I'm looking at a year's C and D for me, I, I know I'm going to have this project. I, I'm not going to have enough for a container. So it would be more uh, acceptable on my budget if I were in that kind of project to say, I can pay you $30. If it's $30 a ton, if you want to save for a pickup truck and not have to have a container because I don't have that kind of volume. But at least I still have the option if I'm paying $30 to put it on that site and not paying $60 plus my time burning a tank of gas with the cost to go to where this location might be. So I'm just kind of looking at the logistics in the county, whether it be at 9814 or in State National. Either way you look at that, if you cut that option out from underneath the residence, that's that's really not affordable. So you Maybe more people to take the risk to dump it on somewhere around the world. I wasn't well, suggesting that. I don't know. I'm yeah, just I wasn't saying, suggesting that we just turn that. anybody <laughs> off. I, <laughs> I think we, what we've been struggling with for quite some time is how to collect money outside, revenue outside of the assessment. I, I wasn't suggesting that we just cut people off. Um, we just haven't been able to come to um, to come up with a good solution at this point for for handling that type of debris. That gentleman that was commissioned and I helped unload that trailer load of open him to he moved to Taylor County and bought a piece of property just recently. And he was I was unloading stuff and I walked over to see the man. He had a trailer load of open him cut up about three foot long, anywhere from two inches to four inches. Old load, just it was a beautiful load of firewood for somebody, but he was putting it in the in the dumpster. I walked over and helped him, and I saw his tag, and I said, "Oh, you just passing through, or you you live here?" He said he just bought a place, and he was you know cleaning it up, trimming trees up. And I said, "Well, what?" I said, "You, you can get, be in your own place here now. You can dump this here." And he said, "Yes." Yeah. And I said, uh, "What was what would that cost you where you come from?" He said, if you brought one limb or a truckload of limbs at six dollars, no question, you had to pay six dollars. If it was one piece of wood or a truckload of wood, it was six dollars. Everybody would come in there with any kind of any kind of thing had to pay six dollars. And that kind of number work in the type of county? <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm willing to start somewhere. I mean, we got it. We, like Ms. Long said, we've got to get to that point we're at. But we keep talking about we got to get to that point. We're already at that point. Sure. I mean, we're already at the point we got to do something. And I mean, we we talked this thing and talked it to death already today again. And we've got to make a decision, get to the point to handle what we're spending the money and hiring the people and working. 
we need to pay for it. I mean, the people going to say, well, we already you done went up on 178. You know, now what do you want? You know, charge it. So, I mean, that's, that's a tough decision making. I mean, I'm not saying that's right. I mean, it's like make it, but we need, we've got to, we got to look at this thing close and we need to look at it. We don't need to just keep it, putting it down. We need to work at it or, you know, just like we are now discussing all of it. But that, that one, every other day that we talked about, I don't think people have any problem with that. But you, you understand if we go to three 12 hour days and you're at seven 10 hour days, is that fair, Mr. One Pope? Are those sites that are seven days, 10 hours? What's your question? What's the question? What I'm saying is, if you cut it to every other day or three days, you're going to go nearly to half your hours. Right. You're going to go 70 if it's 36. seven, 10 hour days to 36. You got it. We've got issues that we're trying to work through with where we're at. No, I'm not know. against saving money if that works. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying, saying you're going to cut your. You no, sir. I mean, I'm, I'm open to it. But I'm also going to have to work. They're going to have to work more though. You're going to have to be hauling containers the whole time. I, I mean, I'm just trying to look at the logistics. I'm not opposed to it. I'm willing to try. But I'm also see. really trying to analyze and see yeah. that we're you know, we've been working at 70 hours and then having our drivers <clears> work accordingly. But I, all the I sites don't work. All the sites don't work. You know. All the time, it's only part of the day. Just like Bernard Johnson, they only open after in the afternoon. That's every every day, in it? Yeah. yeah, after lunch. You know, it's just half the day. And I mean, and that's the real. That's why I don't get a lot of business on the weekends. It does, but you know, it gets it gets a certain amount during the week, but most it's just the weekend. You know, uh, closing Sunday. Every five Sunday would be a good start, and we can get an idea from them. I mean, I mean that would be. Let's do this. Let's do this study and see which day is the slowest day. Bernard Johnson site. It opened from what time? Twelve o'clock to seven. The Bernard Johnson. Yeah. I think it's still. Is that Johnson? Yes. Yes. All oh, seven and all year round. the change to yeah. six. It's to six, yeah. And daylight. Does anybody know? Are they going to do daylight savings time? Or has anybody heard? Are they going to? I haven't heard that it's been revealed. Is that, is that your question? I haven't heard that. Okay. So I just need to bring back the information you requested. It just start. We'll give us something to go on anyway. November the sixth, daylight saving time. It's um mm -hmm. November the sixth. According to my time. Do you wish mm -hmm. to schedule another workshop or do you want to wait until our meeting next week? Because I have we have some other items we need to discuss as far as scheduling. I think we should keep these meetings to discuss just solid ways so we can. Yes, no, my question was, do you want to schedule the next workshop now or do you want to wait until? Oh, um, because um, we need to have a special meeting on October 25th. And I also would like sometime in November to bring a state of the county presentation to the board. And um, y'all, before the end of the year, we need to schedule ethics training if you have not done that yet. So just some some other um, items that we need to schedule. Can you do that and have it here so everybody can mm -hmm. come and do it all at one time and get it done with? Where can we do that ethics training and be better? The what? We need to get the ethics for us behind it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Where you fall? Special meeting this time for uh, the 25th. We would like to have a special meeting, um, no six o'clock to in the workshop to follow.
<clears throat> so do you want to consider maybe having another solid waste uh, workshop, maybe the first week of November? Gary, can we get all that done by the first week of November, you think? If you've got to decide if you're going to do the study, how long are you going to take it for? And then, you know, you've got to have time to and make leave. a conclusion with what you've got. Um, you go in a week. I know that. Probably two weeks study. I would think so. Um, Alcilla committed to a week. They felt like they, because they said they would help us. Um, the landfill said they would help us and they needed us to um, have one employee for spend a week with them. Now I'm assuming that means five days. Mm -hmm. It could mean six. I feel like rather two weeks rather than a week. So. Yeah, if you're going to collect data, you want to make sure that you're you're getting enough of data and, and I can ask. Data. Right. I can ask. I mean, they. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you meant it. I'm sorry. Okay. What we're going to do. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I got you. Okay, so um, we have a meeting on the 18th. We have a special meeting and a workshop on the 25th. So maybe on the 8th. Wait a minute, wait a minute. We got a special meeting. Our regular meeting is on the 18th, right? Yes, sir. And then the workshop is the 25th. We want to have a special meeting at 6 o'clock and a workshop to follow. So it would still be at 6 o'clock. So the two, so there's three dates we need to look at outside of the regular meetings. One is ethics training, one is another solid waste workshop, and I would like to schedule maybe in November a state of the county presentation, and that usually takes a couple of hours. Mm -hmm. I was thinking we could, we could do ethics training. Uh, to get that I will reach out to um, to Miss Barrettson tomorrow. <clears throat> I, I mean, I think I just we just need to come up with a date and and just coordinate it with her. We can but, do that in here just like we did for, before. Mm -hmm. be as far as I know, now I'll double check, but I'll I'll reach out to her and ask about that. Yes. So so on the 18th we can discuss these dates. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yes. <laughs> the county, that, that needs to be a special meeting. I mean, does another member workshop work for that? Was there going to be a? Uh, no, we could do it um, the November. Well, it depends on Thanksgiving. Let me look at those dates. And I'm looking at third. Uh, Tuesday, 15th of November. And then next week is Thanksgiving. So I'll look at our approved calendar and see if we what date we had the November workshop scheduled. So I'll bring that back to all of you next week. Okay. It would hurt my feelings for that. Meeting on November the 22nd at 9 to be moved up a week. Yeah, I'll be, that's the week of Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. I'll be out. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be out on the 15th. <laughs> of November. Now, remember, we have reorganization the second meeting in November. So I'll bring the calendar back to y'all next week. Yeah, and we can... be out. I'll be out on the 15th of November. You going hunting? You going on your big trip? The fifteenth. I always go every year. Fifteenth. I'm there on the fifteenth. So if if you all can 
kind of look at your October and November calendars. We'll see if we can get all this scheduled. If we need to put off the state of the county until, you know, after Thanksgiving, I mean, that would be fine too. Maybe just have one at Christmas. <laughs> well, it, it won't take long. I mean, and we could do it maybe during the November workshop. I mean, y'all don't have to take any action. And I don't know of any particular workshop items in November that we're planning right now. I mean, that could change. If it's an eight hour for the meeting, sir. If it's special, that's supposed to be eight hours? No, oh, four, no. Four. But I, it seems like last year it didn't take quite that long, did it? Was it a full four hours? Oh. At least we keep it there most of that time. Yeah. But we didn't, I don't think we had any breaks. That's why I'm wondering if we got done a little bit quicker. Than we got done a little bit early. Yeah. All right. All right. You have nothing in? Yes, sir. Any more? Okay. Call for a gun. Do you call for a gun? Go on. Go on.